Coming up on Over a Barrel. The SPR, um, I think what most Americans have been talking about, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, um, is likely wrapping up um, the uh, the millions of barrels. I think this was part of the 26 million barrel release. Um, should be wrapping up any day now, Matt. So the SPR, um, we're likely to start seeing now increase um, as the Biden administration starts to refill it. So are the prices on the way up or down? Find out the answer now on Over a Barrel. And welcome to today's episode of Over a Barrel. I'm one of the two hosts, Matt McLean, alongside Patrick DeHaan, who happens to be the other host. And hello, Patrick. How are you? I'm great, Matt. Episode number 20. We've made it out of the teens. I would say that we're all grown up now, and next week will be the legal <laughs> adult episode. It'll be fantastic. That's it, when we introduce the bourbon, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure you already have. Isn't that the case? I mean, maybe uh, we shouldn't say. I, I think there maybe was one episode, but uh, yeah, you I know, so. we can. Yeah. Still <laughs> a lot to talk about. I feel like we might need some bourbon with as much as we're going to cover today. Yeah. You know, uh, as as the world turns to pardon the soap opera pun, um, there are a lot of things that are transpiring really in the overall general economy. Also, the the obviously the fuel and oil uh, economy, that segment, we've got strikes uh, either underway and or looming, depending upon which profession we're talking about, which will also take a hit on the economy. Then we've got the geopolitical things. I I'm running out of breath um i mean we there there's stuff that i see out there that could take the price and send it upward and that i also see stuff that could push the price down i mean what's your crystal ball showing i mean what are we looking mm -hmm. at here yeah oh, yeah i mean to your point there's a lot of things that could go in either direction um having said that oil prices have really perked up in fact some of the most solid increases uh we are now on three straight weeks of oil prices rising um, and so uh, uh, today finds oil prices finally giving up a little bit of the, the three week rally. Uh, but oil prices last week, Matt, touched $76 a barrel uh, for West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil. Last week, they also touched $80 for Brent. So um, three straight weeks is a pretty hefty increase. Now, a lot of that was because of production outages from Libya. Uh, where we saw protests uh, shutting down some of the oil production. And keep in mind, Saudi Arabia, we are in mid-July, and we are just around the corner from uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, extension of its production cut, which will go into the month of August. And we're coming into the peak of uh, uh, gasoline demand season. And I think, to your point about some of that economic data, Matt, um, there have been some uh, conflicting pieces of data, some things, you know, worrisome. I think ADP had a number last week that showed a lot more job growth, but then uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics showed that there weren't as many jobs added. Um, and so, you know, oil prices kind of making heads or tails of it. Uh, but again, some of these outages and keep in mind the SPR, um, I think what most Americans have been talking about, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve um, is likely wrapping up. Um, the, uh, the millions of barrels, I think th this was part of the 26 million barrel release, um, should be wrapping up any day now, Matt. So the SPR, um, we're likely to start seeing now increase, um, as the Biden administration starts to refill it. What that means is that obviously oil not coming out, going into it, uh, that's putting more demand in the market coupled with those production cuts I mentioned from Saudi Arabia, um, Russia also moving along with those production cuts. So that's why we've been getting some of this upward pressure on oil prices. And Matt, that could translate into higher gas prices. So, you know, I know you shared that picture with me that you paid, I think it was two eighty nine a gallon. Yes, I enjoyed that. I'm sure you, you know, <laughs> a, a whole lot of us would enjoy it. Matt, please distribute the wealth. We we need that. I'm, you know, my corner station here in Chicago is four nineteen a gallon. So I'd, oh I'd love God. to you know, pay a dollar and 30 cents less. Um, yeah, I, I have thoroughly enjoyed that. Now, I, I have also been in, what, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, Missouri. All the low price states with the exception uh, of Illinois. Well, Florida, Florida, you know what? Florida was actually, yes, it wasn't $4 and something, but it was obviously, in my experience, the more expensive of all of the states that I've just mentioned. Uh, Illinois, obviously, uh, is quite quite high as well. Um, 
you know, you mentioned some of the things that weren't even on uh, my scope of radar on this end, uh, some of the aspects that you're looking at. So like the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, obviously not contributing to the uh, quantity of oil, but now, you know, soon switching to taking oil. Uh, that's yeah. kind of a double whammy. Um, you know, instead of extra oil going out into the right. economy, it's going to start siphoning, so to speak. There's a lot of moving parts that could create some uh, waves uh, or, you know, ripples, if you will, in the in the oil uh, price point just a little bit there. Can you kind of break uh, a little bit more down for us with regard to some of that? I mean, we had talked about, you know, the different aspects of strikes, um, which has a multi-billion with a B dollar impact on the overall economy. UPS is talking about striking at the end of this month and who doesn't get, you know, things like Amazon packages and, stu and right. stuff delivered. Um, um, you also have uh, different aspects of the economy. I mean, uh, you know, things watching on television and other aspects uh, are about to get uh, interesting because of all the different strikes going on uh, with actors and writers and other aspects, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it has a dramatic impact, believe it or not, on the overall economy as well to the tune of billions. So there's a lot out there that can hurt the economy. There sounds like there might be a few things that could possibly aid or help the economy. Mm -hmm. Then you've got things like Ukraine and Russia and a few other odds and ends that... All all the goodies. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot out there for you to really kind of keep an eye on. Yeah, there certainly is. I think the UPS strikes are a really interesting one because not only you're talking about a key contributor to the U.S. economy in terms of, you know, logistics and moving Amazon orders and whatnot. Um, you know, it's going to be really, uh, really interesting because not only, you know, do we rely on UPS and, you know, companies like FedEx to deliver these packages, they contribute a huge amount to GDP. Now, um, you know, talking about the broader economy, I think I saw some reports that UPS delivers something like one percentage point of GDP, which sounds tiny, but it's huge. That's a huge the interesting. Amount. Yeah, it is. And, you know, to be talking about potentially a, an outage of service there um, as a result of that, which is huge, right? A single point a percentage point of the GDP is, is you know, billions and billions of an impact. Um the interesting thing is UPS consumes a lot of, of, of liquid fuels, jet fuel, diesel, right, uh, are the two that really power the core of UPS. And so depending on the severity of the strike, you know, if, if these delivery drivers, which are, you know, driving around vehicles that use diesel and LNG and electricity, you know, if, if this fleet stops, Especially if if the airline pilots keep in mind, I believe UPS is the second largest airline mm -hmm. in the world. Um, calculated we, by we don't stop size. and think about it because yeah. their airline is carrying right. all the packages. <laughs> but but yeah, no, that you're exactly right. It's a, it's enormous. So they, I mean, they're they're you know they're consuming um, millions of gallons of fuel every day. Just UPS. So if that grinds to a halt, you know there could be a, a broader impact on the economy. You know, obviously, a lot of customers are going to then start flooding over to FedEx um, and other logistics, like even U.S. Postal Service, where possible. So, you know, that could uh, that could have a, a major impact on overall uh, liquid fuels consumption. Uh, but to the point where if they stop, that could also slow the economy down. Matt, uh, we we've talked extensively, I think, the last several episodes about, you know, in the last year or two, the economy and the direction which it's perceived to be heading is having a major impact on oil prices. And, you know, on one side of this, you have a big concern that, you know, a strike is really going to limit demand and limit how we can spend money. But then on the other side, um, you know, OPEC has been busy cutting production to shore up the supply side, or I should say really to cut down supply um, so that the market is tight. So those two forces are kind of competing and, you know, with the SPR, basically, as, as you also said, the SPR is no longer adding oil into the market. It's going to be taking oil out of the market. That's kind of a reversal, right? We've been, we've been seeing the SPR add supply to the market basically since, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So to see that flip around um, and with all these other economic pressures that you mentioned um, and the fact that now Colorado State University, which is one of the you know major institutions forecasting hurricane season. I don't know, Matt. For for those of the uh, those of of us who pay attention to those things, um, CSU just raised its hurricane forecast 
for uh, the Atlantic hurricane season to, uh, I believe, four to six major hurricanes. So again, the risk there. And I can even explain a little bit more on why. And a part of that is because the water temperatures are so uh, hot, especially in the Gulf of Mexico, where a lot of those oil platforms happen to be. Some of the water temperatures coming back are, you know, 97 degrees. And you just took a trip to Florida. Did you get in the water? Yeah, Uh, Yeah. uh, it, it is bath water. And it is not totally abnormal for water temperatures to be 90, 92 degrees this time of the year, which is why it feels, in my opinion, a little bit on the what I call the gross side. But when it's hitting 97, 98 degrees, I mean, that's body temperature. That is um, that is a lot of fuel. And so there you have a different forecaster. Yeah, you know, you're exactly right. And, and and you've got a lot of forecasters like Colorado saying, hey, um, we're kind of a little concerned that because the water temperatures in the Gulf and even into the Atlantic are five to six, seven degrees warmer than normal, that could create um, some problems. So they have upped their forecast. So we have a lot of what ifs out there or yeah. a better way of maybe visualizing it, a lot of plates spinning. Um, and, and it looks like one of them at any moment. And now my mind is all right off. Right. <laughs> and it looks like at any moment, one of those plates could just kind of just go yeah. tumbling off the little the little stick and just fall right down and crash and go boom. So, I mean, there's a there's there's so many things out there. Uh, you, you know, let's the geopolitical aspect, um, as we talked about the other strikes. And I know it doesn't sound it sounds very distant. Oh, the actors are on strike. Big deal. OK, well, uh, let me go ahead. Since I do video production, all those other aspects, I can easily in about 15 seconds tell you why that has a direct impact on basically everyone less production out there fewer advertisements that companies buy because there's no uh programs or products out there for them to advertise with so you have a lot of marketing aspect that suddenly dries up because there are no new programs to buy advertising on especially in the world of streaming. So that is an on-demand advertising platform. If you don't have anything to watch, you don't watch it. And therefore, a lot of money that was going to be spent in marketing now no longer is spent to the tune of billions upon billions of dollars. So that's just one facet of that particular strike. Again, the UPS strike and other aspects. Then you've got Ukraine and you have Russia and you have China and... I mean, my gosh. Um, speaking of China. That's a lot. Yeah. And, and speaking of China, Matt, um, um, just fresh data that came out um, over the weekend was, I think actually um, overnight here, was that the Chinese economy uh, saw growth, but the growth was almost a percentage point below expectations. So China's GDP um, was a miss. It was expected uh, to rise by over 7%. Uh, But GDP for second quarter was up um, just 0.8% from the first quarter at 6.3%. So uh, again, China's economy, um, you know, is is a powerhouse now. And the Chinese economy is really critical to the overall global balance of, of oil supply and demand. So to see the Chinese economy missing expectations on its recovery as it you know, it's been reopened now since December. Um, it's really struggling though. And and so that is that is bearish uh, for oil prices that the Chinese economy is not coming out of the gates, right? Like a horse in a horse race. So they, they've really stalled. And that's even a, a piece of the puzzle. Um, and as the Federal Reserve, you know, and a lot of this economic data impacts the way the Federal Reserve approaches its monetary policy, right? If some of the data comes in better than expected, well, the Federal Reserve may have, to, may have to raise interest rates more to get the economy to slow down. And that pushes oil prices down, right? Because when they raise interest rates, it also slows the economy down. So to your point, I mean, from a potential UPS strike, uh, from actors striking, which, and keep in mind too, that a lot of these shows, uh, Chicago Fire, PD, you know, everything based here in Chicago, a lot of that money also flows into the local economy. So mm-hmm. to your point, you know, there, there, there is some carryover there. Um, there. There seems to be more on the bearish side right now going into the fall, you know, especially since we are basically halfway through summer, Matt. Um, I, I feel like such a Debbie Downer saying that, that summer's mm-hmm. half over. But um, demand for gasoline, like we are in our peak right now for the next week or two. 
And then we're going to start to see the back to school stuff really ramp up in August. And then I think we'll see some more downward pressure on gas prices. The biggest question, I think, Matt, is will OPEC continue to tighten their policy? Will they continue to extend their production cuts? Um, I think they're going to have to, because I think with a lot of this news that we're talking about basically being bearish on the economy, that OPEC may have to continue to tighten output if they want to keep prices elevated. And, and by the way, Citibank came out with a forecast that suggested that um, we could see $80 crude, but by the end of the year, um, we could see that falling uh, uh, to the $60 a barrel range by the end of next year. So uh, again, I do think there's some upside here, especially now with the SPR releases being done. And especially with OPEC's production cut, I do think there's more risk to the upside uh, for the price of oil. But keep in mind, gasoline may move a little differently because remember how we switched back to cheaper winter gasoline? That happens in mid-September. And as I just mentioned, demand for gasoline is really just on the cusp of peaking. So you could still see lower gas prices this fall, Matt, even if you do see more expensive oil prices. So just want to be clear on that. There's a lot there, yeah, to basically unpack, so to speak. You kind of indirectly talked about it just a little bit with the price of oil possibly being at $60 by the end of next year. Uh, One of the stories, you know, that I've been monitoring uh, fairly closely is that big R word, recession. Hmm. Uh, Some forecasters, even the federal government talking about, well, we were kind of anticipating a a light recession before the end of 2023 this year. Um, Now the forecasters are kind of saying, nah, it's not looking so bad. Yeah. We're thinking 2024. And even if that happens, uh, we're expecting it to be basically like a toe dipping into the water, yep. so to speak. It's a very light recession. Um, I don't know uh, if all of these upheavals are being taken into consideration for that, the UPS strike and other aspects, if they are basically computing that into their forecast or not, um, it would be probably a bit difficult to do so. But is that kind of why they are thinking that the price of oil may decline down to even $60 a barrel uh, before the end of next year. Well, I think that's really it. I think in the in the short term here, Matt, we have some pressure, um, upward pressure. Like I mentioned right now, I think the market is tipped uh, with a little bit less crude oil. That's, that is, it's tipping towards um, concerns about supply. And that's why oil prices could go up uh, to the 80s by... Um, the end of the summer, especially if there's a hurricane. But then as we do start to see the uh, the higher interest rates starting to slow the economy down more substantially, especially you know into 2024, I think that's where you see some of the bearishness in the price of oil. So you know Citibank saying we see prices that could hit $88 a barrel by the end of the summer before falling to the 70s this winter. And then by the end of 2024, they could get to the 60s. I think that is certainly exactly why, you know, the recession seems to be more down the road. And it may be a lighter recession. You know, Janet Yellen saying over the weekend that she thinks we can avoid a recession. We'll have to see. Because even things like this strike, Matt, could push the needle enough in one direction. The UPS strike could be a big problem. Yeah. And also taking, for example, uh, you know, regional uh, types of situations, for example, the majority of the southern uh, uh, farmers that grow peaches, Georgia, they lost 90 percent of their peach crop, which is for the state of Georgia is is over a billion with a B dollars in 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 economy, economic revenue for them. Uh, They lost all that because of the freezes that we had late in this past spring. So Mm -hmm. they have no peaches to sell to the rest of the world and to the country. Uh, So there are many uh, faucets to this this aspect. And yeah, yeah, maybe maybe what you're looking at is, you know, Janet Yellen, for example, uh, are they are they computing all of that? Are they looking mm-hmm. at all of that or are they tunnel tunnel vision where it's like, oh, no, as as things are right now, you know, here's what we see. I, I have to admit, what am I, 45, 46 years of age? And this is one of the first times I can recall where we've actually kind of on purpose tried to slow things down. Yeah, and I guess we should pity those Georgia peach farmers, uh, no pun intended. Right. Um, 
you know, I, I don't think that that's something that, you know, the, the Federal Reserve is looking at a lot of these high level issues. So Janet Yellen's kind of looking at the housing market, looking at CPI, core inflation, you know, looking at energy prices. And by the way, some good news, too, is that we continue to see above average natural gas injections ahead of the winter. Um, but, Matt, I do think, you know, as, as we round the corner, you talk about agricultural, uh, the price of diesel. Um, has really, you know, been on a, a downward spiral that in the last week has slowed down. Um, but, you know, for anyone out there that uses heating oil, um, you know, or farmers that are looking towards their crops, we're probably a few weeks away from starting to see diesel prices rise on a seasonal basis. Because keep in mind why gas prices are highest in the summer is because demand for gasoline is highest in the summer. Um why diesel prices are tend to be lower in the summer is because diesel demand tends to be lower in the summer before it goes up in the fall and winter because not necessarily diesel, but heating oil, which is basically the same thing as, as diesel. Heating oil consumption goes up as we not only farmers you know use a lot of diesel to harvest their crops in the fall, uh, but then a lot of folks in the Northeast that still use heating oil are filling up their heating oil tank. So um, I do think that gas prices this fall are likely to go down. Um, but diesel prices are going to buck that trend. So again, if anyone needs to fill their heating oil tanks, uh, generally the summer is the best time and that's holding true now. In fact, diesel prices, Matt, uh, the wholesale price of diesel in, um, um, uh, quite a bit of the country is, is pretty close to that of gasoline. Uh, it's, it's actually diesel, uh, is cheaper in the West coast than gasoline is. So it's not a bad time, but you know, a lot of economic uncertainty, uh, the national average has been stuck in a rut kind of funny and ironic that since May, Matt, we've been stuck in the range of 350 to 360 gallon. And only very briefly uh, on July 4, did we did we go uh, under the 350 mark? And a lot of that was only because of sheets and their promotion that they did in the East Coast. But the national average is, I don't think this has ever happened, that we've been stuck in a 10 cent range for the basically the entirety of of the last, you know, four months or so. And that's where we are today. The national average at 353. Um, you know, a week ago, we were at 352. A month ago, we were at 355. <laughs> so, you know, maybe not a bad thing that prices are pretty quiet, but the national average um, last year was in a free fall um, in the month of August, uh, in July and August. And so, you know, um, prices for gasoline, that's what the CPI looks at, right? Is year over year decreases, the price of gasoline peaked in June at a dollar and fifty cents. Then June of 2022, in July, it's probably going to be more like a dollar a gallon less than 2022, and in August, it's probably going to be only 65 to 75 cents less than 2022. So the bottom line, Matt, is that's going to affect the CPI numbers. Gasoline has been pulling the inflation numbers down, but with that gap now shrinking compared to last year, those CPI numbers, um, you know they might start to, to put a little bit more pressure on the Fed again. So then the question that I have is, what's causing the stagnation in price uh, jolts? Because, you know, in years past, uh, boy, do we ever have, you know, usually a lot to talk about. I mean, is it is it us as a nation kind of collectively holding our breath, wondering what's going to happen next um, in the economy or Ukraine, Russia, China, uh, and a whole slew of other things? I mean, what, in your opinion, is creating that stagnation? Well, I again, I think it's a, kind of a tug of war that's being balanced on both sides, right? You have economic concern on one side, lower demand, which is why, you know, oil prices had fallen into the 60s. But OPEC is now um, is now toying with the supply side by cutting supply. So that's why we've been stuck in this range, Matt, is because the the scale has been balanced. Supply and demand have been balanced um, because of, of some of the actions OPEC has taken, because the economy has been soft. If, if the balance tips in one of those directions um, in the months ahead, it's obviously going to pull gasoline prices or, or oil prices with it. So Again, we've been remarkably balanced, all things considered. And keep in mind, too, you know, when you talk about the Russia thing, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, keep in mind, too, something to uh, keep an eye on. Um, a lot of the reason for inflation is because Ukraine has been a agriculture powerhouse, right? Russia has also produced oil, but Russia did just pull out of the Black Sea uh, grain treaty, which basically allowed um, these grains to get to where they need to go to provide 
the global market with food. So yeah. if Russia imperils those cargoes, we could be looking at more inflationary pressure from the price of wheat and other agricultural items that Ukraine generally produces. So if that grain can't get out of Ukraine, we could start to see the cost of, of, of you know, grains globally going up, and that could be another inflationary impact. You know, there's a lot of, of things for us to really... <laughs> I almost feel like we need something on like a whiteboard on the wall of different things that we need to monitor um, and, and say, hey, we've got this, we've got this, we've got this. Uh, we have so many things and almost kind of, you know, divided out geopolitical versus, you know, domestic versus, uh, you know, greater economy, uh, oil, because every single one of these things can and do impact the price that you as as a listener pay at the pump and and both Patrick and myself pay at the pump and I pay a lot of money at the pump a lot. <laughs> Not as much as I do. I'll tell you that. <laughs> no, that is, that is, I pay, I pay a lot more uh, at the pump, uh, I think, uh, than most people just because of everything that I, I have going on with my travels. So um, I'm, I'm fairly um, sensitive to making sure that, you know, the price point is there, which by the way, I did save a lot uh, on, on with my gas baddie uh, app. I do want to point that out um, that I, I did actually save quite a bit, uh, sometimes 25, 30 cents a gallon uh, over this last trip that I made because of the gas buddy app. I, did, I just want to throw that, that little free plug in. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, I, you know, Matt, I, I always, um, and especially you know, on a longer road trip, that's a, a prime example of when to use it, right? You cross all those state boundaries and the price is just all over the map. And like you mentioned, Tennessee is cheap. Georgia, maybe not quite as cheap. And then you get to Florida and it's a little bit more expensive. So, mm -hmm. you know, basically the Gas Buddy app was probably telling you, hey, fill up before you leave Tennessee, fill up before you leave Georgia. Um, and I, you know, I basically never fill up in Illinois, which by the way, since the last time we spoke, I think we spoke in early July, but... Um, What's becoming more common, Matt, is that uh, states are adjusting gasoline taxes twice a year, January 1st and July 1st. And Illinois is one of those states that saw another three cent gas tax increase on July 1st. And, you know, you, <laughs> you look at the country, Matt, and right, you look at the gas buddy heat map and, you know, the West Coast is always a different color, right? The West Coast is always very yellow because prices are very high. And the South states like Mississippi are always very purple because they're very low. And Illinois is about the only exception, right? Illinois- it's Kind of like an island. It, it very much is. And, you know, I'm zooming into St. Louis right now, Matt, because it's a great example. Um, I'm looking at gas prices on the Illinois side, 362, 359, 399, 359. And you look on the St. Louis side and I see- 309, 319, 317, 329, prices that are a good 25 to 30 cents less. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have a great example of why you fire up the Gas Buddy app. And just so happens that I work for them. But even if they got rid of me or something else, Matt, I'm, I'm always going to save that, you know, 20 or 30 cents a gallon. Yeah, it certainly uh, definitely adds up uh, over the course of a of a twelve month period, and I can attest to that firsthand. So there's a lot of that we've talked about. We've talked about Russia, Ukraine, China, and the geopolitical aspects of things. We're pretty cool with Canada, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and we're pretty cool with Mexico. So I don't see anything, you know, other than the Canadian smoke that has uh, the wildfire smoke uh, that has impacted uh, really a large swath of the Midwest and Upper South and and uh, Northeast. Um, I don't see anything crazy happening there. And, and we love their maple syrup as well. So there are those, those aspects. But as far as price points go, uh, what are you kind of seeing in a forecast really over the next couple of weeks? Well, Matt, I, you know, I, I don't think we're going to break out of this, you know, this cycle of 360 to 340, uh, 360, 350 to 360. Wow, my, I'm getting too far ahead in my, uh, my, you know, my head here. Uh, but it, it's been interesting watching because for the last few weeks, the most common gas prices, Matt, what we call the mode, right? Uh, this is elementary school. You have mean, media, and mode. Um, the mode, the most common gas prices in the U.S. really haven't changed a whole lot. Um, today finds the most common gas price in the U.S. at three twenty nine dollars a gallon. And before people get excited and say there's no three twenty nine dollars near me, no, you might be right. But overall, uh, there are thousands of stations in the U.S. at three twenty nine. dollars The second most common price, $349. Um, and the other three most common prices, 319, 339, and 309. And by the way, that's kind of a, a cool uh, case in psychology that all of the prices end in nine, 
right? Because mm-hmm. what would you rather be, 339 or 340? 339 sounds way better. And yet it's 339.9. <laughs> yeah, exactly. as close as you can get to 340. But, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that um, hopefully, you know, barring a hurricane or other unexpected outage, Matt, I'm not really seeing much of a reason that we're going to break out of this range. I think once we get into the second half of August, I think there will be more downward pressure on prices because gasoline demand starts to really go down by mid-August. Mm-hmm. And then the, the other key date is going to be September 15th. And that's the last day that across the country that summer gasoline is required. So on September 16th, um, refineries can basically start supplying winter gasoline, which in some regions of the country, there's a a big difference between the cost of summer gasoline and non-summer gasoline. Right now in Chicago, uh, they're having to pay about 27 cents a gallon extra for the required gasoline, uh, the, the, the type of gasoline that's required in Chicagoland. So some areas that require more stringent blends, especially like California, are going to see a bigger drop when they start making the transition back to winter gasoline, which, by the way, for the entire country, except California, that transition happens um, September 16th. And in California, unfortunately, it goes a little bit longer. Some areas in California use summer gasoline until um, the end of September, some until the end of October. Do gas stations, in your experience, usually... Uh, immediately deduct that savings or do they kind of let it slowly taper off? I mean, what's your experience with all of that? Like, how do they adjust those prices? Um, Well, you know, stations always generally slowly pass it along. Uh, It's generally not an all at once approach. But the beauty of competition, Matt, is that when somebody's paying 25 or 30 cents a gallon less, they're going to start undercutting their competitor pretty quickly by two or three cents to have the better price, which will drive their volume up. And then the competition is going to match that price. They're going to go down. And so, you know, it usually takes about a a week or two for for it to be fully passed along. But once it's gone, it's gone until next spring. Gotcha. Is there anything else out there that really is on your radar that maybe we did not touch on? Because there's an awful lot. I've got a lengthy list on my side. Well, Matt, I think, you know, we, we've hit hurricane season. We hit OPEC and, and all of the, you know, geopolitical uh, issues. Libya, keep in mind, um, Libya has been a big one. They're a huge producer of oil, uh, keeping in, 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 uh, an eye on what's going on there. Uh, but OPEC, right? OPEC's had some disagreements, but it, now it seems like Russia and Saudi Arabia are aligned at cutting production. So we'll have to see if that holds up. But for now, um, you know, we're in the peak of driving season. Gas prices are right in the middle of the 350s. Um, You know, it shouldn't be too eventful, knock on wood, the next four to six weeks. Anyone hitting the road trip, like you said, pack the Gas Buddy app. Check out the Pay with Gas Buddy card at pay.gasbuddy.com. You can find a a station that um, offers gas up to 25 cents a gallon lower with what we call deal alerts. If you have any questions, like I said, you can go to pay.gasbuddy.com. But Matt, uh, great to be with you. Another episode here halfway through the summer months. Let's hope it's a uneventful close to the summer uh, as that happens over the next uh, four to six weeks. Absolutely. And of course, you can reach out to us on Twitter. Uh, I am at Over a Barrel Matt. You've got at Gas Buddy Guy for Patrick. And of course, Over a Barrel Show for the actual show itself. You can also drop us an email. We love getting uh, emails from you. In fact, a lot of the questions that we, you know, kind of surmise throughout a lot of this, we actually get uh, as suggestions from you. So we love hearing from you. Um, Patrick, what's the email address? Yeah, Matt. uh, Great point there. Podcast at gasbuddy.com is where they can send any emails. Or like you said, of course, uh, reach out to us on Twitter, on social media, over a barrel show. 